Okay, uh, welcome everyone to Osmo Dev Call today. Um, the topic is um, PySim Shell with uh, Sysmo ISIM uh, SJA5, which is a programmable SIM card. Um, and um, let me actually uh, show you one in case you haven't seen a picture or something yet. So I just grab from, from one from the stack uh, card looks like this uh, on the front side and that on the back side. I mean, it's just a normal plastic card as usual. I'm uh, going to insert it into a, a reader. So it's inserted in an Omni key, uh, but of course any other reader uh, will work as long as it supports um, the um, PCSC Lite, which is the driver stack for smart cards uh, on many operating systems, including uh, new Linux-based operating systems. So um, let's try a PCSC scan. So yes, we see um, there is uh, actually two readers in my systems system, but we see here a reader zero is this Omni key reader and it detects a card with a certain ATR that is uh, displayed here. So um, the reader and the card uh, are detected. Um, and now it's about PySim. Um, so what I will do is I will do a fresh clone. Um, so we avoid um, any contamination from my R&D system. So um, oh, actually I already created the directory. And now I'll do a um, do a fresh clone of the Pysim Git repository. Go into it. Of course, all the dependencies that Pysim requires are already pre-installed here. Uh, this is uh, not uh, realistic for most systems, as you will not have all the requirements installed. But there's a README file, and the documentation explains to you how to install those requirements. So in this case, we can just straight, straight away start Python shell. Um, we pass it the P0 flag for using the PCSC reader number zero. You see here on top, uh, reader zero. Uh, this is what the zero refers to here. Um, we started. And um, as you can see, it uh, detects uh, a card, it detects some uh, what we call add-ons uh, on the card and uh, some applications with application identifiers here. Um, so um, this is uh, rather comprehensive on other SIM card models. You will see less of those lines being printed as they support less applications or um, apps uh, or whatever, add-ons, sorry, not apps, add-ons, um, as we call them here. So um, yeah, the card is detected. It's also detected. It's a Sysmocom SJA5 uh, card. Um, uh, why does it say Sysmocom SJA5 and not Sysmo ISIM SJA5? Uh, because the detection at this level just says, well, it's a Sysmocom card of SJA5 type, whether it's a USIM or an ISIM or some other product um, that is not possible to detect at this point in detail. Um, Sysmocom is selling the card in multiple different profiles, customer-specific profiles, for example. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, all of those have the same ATR um, and, and the same properties, but they might have different um, parameters and different uh, profiles provisioned onto them. So that's why the naming is slightly different here. It's intentional. It's not an accident. So this is meant as a generic term for all Sysmocom cards of SJA5, which means a specific card operating system on a specific set of chips. Um, but then the, the pro profiles might uh, differ from card to card. So um, we are on the PySim shell. I uh, expect um, uh, most people will have seen this before, either in the documentation or a previous presentation. So this is not really a, a one, 101 uh, tutorial. Um, in general, we navigate around the file system. We have a dir command. It's a bit like DOS in that regard. Uh, it's uh, as retro as uh, smart card standards. Um, so um, uh, we can select files. For example, we can select ef.icid. We also have tab completion here. And when we select the file, we get a decode of the um, of the file. Um, a descriptor, whatever the select command returns some some binary blob, and that contains data about the file that has just been uh, selected. 
So we see it's a so-called working elementary file of transparent structure and uh, the file identifier in hex um, and some proprietary information that is not according to the standard. And then access conditions for SIM toolkit, what SIM toolkit applications can do with this file. Um, then also the so-called lifecycle status integer, which we will get to later on. Operational activated is the normal case, meaning the file can be used. Um, and then also here we see the security attributes referenced. Um, and this encodes what kind of permissions are required for which operation on the card. Um, this is all uh, standard. Um, you will see that on any card, I could just put a T-Mobile Germany card or a Vodafone Germany card or whatever other card that I have around here, and I would uh, get the same decode. This is, there's nothing specific to the Sysmocom uh, product in this. This is a standardized um, uh, encoding, decoding of this information. We also see the file size is 10 bytes, um, and it has a short file identifier, which we can ignore. And now I can do read binary, which reads the binary data and gives me a hex dump of the data. That's the hex dump of those 10 bytes. Um, so probably 20 <laughs> hex characters here. Um, and uh, what we also have, actually, let's do a help here. We see what kind of commands we have. Uh, there's different groups of commands. Uh, they depend on uh, basically coming from different specifications. Uh, so we have the ISO 7816 commands. That's the core specification of all things uh, smart card. Uh, then we have PySIM specific commands that uh, are not really related to the card, but related to the PySIM program. Then we have commands that are related to the fact that this is a transparent elementary file and the transparent elementary file have a couple of operations such as update binary, read binary, and their decoded versions. Um, then we have uh, TS102221 specific commands, uh, which are is the UICC specification where we can suspend and resume the card. Then we have the 102222, um, which contains administrative commands for creating, deleting, resizing, and so on files, and uh, a couple of more PySIM shell built-in commands, um, which actually, yeah, there's not so not much of a distinction between the PySIM commands and that one. I'm not sure why there is. It doesn't really make sense to, to separate those. It's more an artifact of how the code is written. Um, yeah, so uh, what the command that we will use here is uh, read binary decoded here, which gives us a just... Um, a decoded version of the file. Um, this looks rather similar and you will see it's just doing nibble swapping and uh, removing the F padding here. So there's an F character here, um, which is basically how the encoding of the file is specified. And you will also see that the output here is actually a JSON document um, between those two lines. Um, and uh, this is how the encoding decoding in PySIM works. Uh, we basically have either the raw binary data and that's always presented as hex, or we have a JSON document that rep represents this data. Um, similarly, th this works with any other file. Um, we, there are some files left where we don't have decoders yet in, in the PySIM uh, program, but uh, by now we've developed encoders, decoders for almost all of the files uh, on, on the card itself. So, um, yeah, I can select other um, files here. Um, let's go to uh, typos happen. Um, so ADF USIM, we see there's some more um, uh, data returned here. We again have the file descriptor. Now it tells us it's a dedicated file, a DF, and uh, it has a, a DF name, which is the application identifier of the USIM application. And uh, the number of memory bytes available on the card in this application and uh, the pin well, the pin status of different pins and, and, and all kinds of other things, which we'll not, not look into details here. But um, let's select the EF MZ. And we do again a read binary decoded and we get the MZ in this document. These are, of course, very simple files because they only contain one uh, specific um, uh, bit of information, so it's rather simplistic decode, but uh, let's say we select, for example, the EFR ARR, which is uh, the access rule references. Uh, that's actually a file that contains um, the permissions. Um, so it's like to, to avoid having to store the detailed permissions of which 
user authenticated by which means can read and or write and or delete or whatever the file. Um, and rather than encoding this in every file, we have this referenced uh, uh, security attributes and um, uh, the, those rules are then stored in EFARR. Uh, this is now a uh, linear fixed file, which means not it is not a transparent file, but a record-oriented file, and it has records of 110 bytes length, uh, and there's 12 of those records. So now I can do something like read a record uh, one, for example. This is the um, binary version of the record, but if I do do you re read record decoded, I will get a decode of the record, and you will see that this is already uh, much more sophisticated or much more comprehensive than uh, that's not just a single uh, a single key value pair in the JSON that is uh, generated. Um, yeah, so this is basically I can navigate around the files and I can explore the card and so on. So in order to actually uh, program the card with uh, configuration uh, data that uh, relates to the network, usually you will have this card uh, so you can run it in a private uh, cellular network. And uh, you might need to adjust some settings to match your network requirements. Um, uh, in order to write to almost all of the files, uh, you need to authenticate yourself with the ADM1 um, pin, which is the administrative pin. That's basically a pin that identifies you as the operator. Um, and uh, then as the operator, uh, you have control over all parts of, the, parts of the card and you can write to any, any file or field. If you're not authenticated with the ADM1 pin, you have normal user privileges uh, like a normal user has with any other SIM card. So um, uh, just like a commercial SIM card from a commercial operator, you can read all kinds of configuration data. But for example, you cannot read the key material from the card, uh, the secret key material. Um, and you can also uh, not uh, modify uh, any um, things that are not specified to be mod user modifiable on the card. So, for example, um, I was to uh, want to modify the IMSI of the card, for example. Uh, let's just take the, the, uh, the, the raw binary value and try something like update binary um, and whatever, uh, put a whatever 99 here in front. Um, then it will tell me that command, uh, the, the command got re rejected. So SW match fail says status word match fail. So we expected a status word of 9,000, but we got 6982 and the decode of 6982 is this security status not uh, satisfied, fail to write chunk. So we couldn't write to the card because we are not uh, properly authenticated. So now I need to check the uh, key material that uh, I received. Um, together with the card. I'm doing this on a different window that's not on the screen here. Just a second, I just need to figure out what the ADM1 value is for this card, which I don't recall off my head. Um, it is the, um, um, let me just, oh yeah, 103101. the key data for this card so the adm1 value is um, this one so what i'm now doing is i do um, verify adm and i copy and paste the adm1 value for this card um, if i don't get any result it means it's successful um, if i'm entering a wrong one then uh, i get an error message and entering the wrong ADM pin is actually dangerous because there's a counter that uh, I think only permits uh, three um, uh, attempts. And if you have three consecutive attempts uh, with the wrong ADM pin, then the card is permanently blocked and you cannot, well, the card is not blocked, but this ADM1 is blocked, meaning you can never authenticate yourself as, AD, uh, as operator uh, with the ADM1 again. Uh, you can still use the card, but you can never change any of the settings that only an operator can cha can change. So um, be careful not to uh, use the wrong ADM1 pin here. So um, now I'm authenticated, and now the update binary uh, command uh, actually works. Uh, I don't get this error message any again. Uh, this was just a bogus random update. It doesn't really make any sense. So that's why I'm going to write again the original data in the file um, uh, getting back to where it was uh, before. Um, so 
Uh, normally, of course, the more convenient way to modify this is not by changing the binary data because it means you need to encode it in your head. Um, you can um, uh, you, there's more comfortable methods uh, to to edit the files or uh, the, the, the data. I will show you in a second. Um, there was just a question uh, from the audience: uh, Does the counter reset once the correct ADM one has been entered? Yes, that's correct. So. Um, whenever you authenticate correctly, uh, the counter resets to three. Um, it's just like a, like with the normal user pin on the card. It's, it behaves the same way. You can enter up to three times consecutively. If it's three times wrong, uh, then you have the PUC, the un unblock uh, value. Um, uh, with the ADM1, there is no unblock value, so uh, you're lost at this point. Um, but um, uh, also with the normal pin, if you enter it wrong twice and then enter it correctly once, uh, next uh, time you again have three tries. So uh, that is reset. So the comfortable way to edit this uh, is actually to say edit binary decoded. And then you will get into your editor, whatever is configured as editor in your operating system in your user preferences. Uh, in this case, it's VI in my case, but you can also start Emacs, Nano, or Gedit, or whatever kind of editor you prefer. Um, and now you have the JSON representation, and this is much more friendly for modification. So uh, let's say I wanted to change the IMSI from 90170 to whatever, uh, 26277 or something like this uh, with the same suffix, um, and I just write this. Um, it will print uh, the hex encoded value to me uh, just uh, for debugging. And if I do um, a read binary decoded now, I will see it has actually changed this value on the card. Um, I will again um, reset this just uh, to, so I don't, uh, this is not really something I wanted to change, it's just for demo. So we were at 999. Yeah, typing is hard sometimes. Um, so now we're back to the original value. So this is a way how it's easy to modify a file um, as long as you know how the JSON document is supposed to look like. And this file again is easy because there's only one key and only one value, so it's easy to edit. Changing other files is slightly more um, complex and sometimes it's not easy to figure out how the JSON is supposed to look like. This is a, how can I say, a known shortcoming um, but uh, yeah, well, um, it's much easier to work with this than work with the binary data in most uh, contexts. So uh, that's it. Um, so for example, um, let's let's take another use case where we see that it's basically without context, it's hard to know how the JSON is supposed to be structured. Um, we can select the ef.f PLMN. That's the forbidden PLMN network list. Um, uh, basically a list of operator codes that the card is not permitted to register or even attempt to register. Um, uh, if we read this file, then we just see, okay, it's a array of four entries and all of them are null. Um, so if we actually want to edit this and put some reasonable content in it, I mean, we can read binary, um, it's just all FF. That's normal on SIM cards uh, since uh, they refer to flash memory and uh, uh, even old EPROMs um, or um, more modern uh, flash memory, the erased state is always all ones, so FF, um, and the program value then is something different. So unused files normally have FF content, so unused uh, data padding is always FF on SIM cards. So yeah, but how, how, we, how do we put data in there? Uh, in my case, I know it, um, so I can give you a demo, but I also show you what you can do if you're not aware of what could possibly be done here. So I will now say um, I want to permit uh, to prevent this card from ever uh, trying to register to T-Mobile Germany. So I put this in here, mobile country code 262, mobile network work 01 as first element in the uh, array of four entries. And if I write this, then I will here again, again get the encoded version of this and read binary decode. I see now the first entry is uh, in this. But how do I know how this is supposed to look like? Well, um, the only way right now really is to either see if there are some examples online somewhere in the documentation or um, 
you can actually look at the source code. Um, um, in this case, this is a, the, the files are oriented based on uh, the specification. So uh, since we are in ADF USIM and the USIM application is specified in TS31102, uh, this is the file in which this is specified. And if I look at FPLMN, um, then actually I see, okay, it's an EFPLMN cell. So it's, it's a nice example because it actually means it's from somewhere else. The FPLMN file uses a, an instance of a class that is imported uh, from TS51011 because basically the same file structure is used in the classic uh, GSM sim um, uh, um, and not just in the USIM. So let's look at the 51011 and for the PLMN cell, yeah. And then here in the beginning, you can already see there's some test vectors and they usually give you a good idea of how the data is supposed to look like. So these are basically for our unit tests of the encoder and decoder. And um, we have uh, this um, uh, basically the hex encode on the left-hand side and the decode on uh, the right-hand side. And here we see that basically something like this is, is the, the JSON format that we can input uh, in, in the JSON side. So in case a file is completely empty, you can look at this um, as a reference for, um, for finding out the, the format. It's not convenient, I understand. Um, but uh, yeah, in many cases, you already have reasonable uh, content and uh, you can edit it. Um, Nice to see 334 there. Well, I don't actually know why. It's probably just from some random SIM card where we copy and pasted this uh, test vector for the encoder decoder. Um, okay, uh, Mikael, this is uh, the favorite uh, neighbor country in Mexico. Okay. Um, yeah, so that was just as, how can I how can I help myself uh, in case I, I don't know how the, the JSON is supposed to be structured in there. Um, now, another topic that we often see is enabling or disabling of files and optional features. So these cards have hundreds of files and each of them has up to dozens of parameters. So we can speak of thousands of parameters that are configurable on the card. And um, we try with those cards to um, to have all the functionality, all the optional features that any spec ever specified, to have that available, um, while at the same time, most users will only need a fraction of those features. So it's a bit of a, contra a contradiction in terms. So at the on the one hand, um, every user only wants a fraction of the features, and on the other hand, we want to have all the features available in the card. And um, many of those optional new features, they mostly relate to uh, later, more modern uh, specification releases. So in this case here, the uh, Sysmo ISM SJA5 is compliant to 3GPP release 17. Uh, so all the files that are present in, in even in release 17, which is the most recent uh, 3GPP release, are uh, supported by the card. But then if you have all those files present, um, but you don't configure them correctly, uh, this can create problems in that the UEs refuse to register to a network or behave in a weird way or some, something just doesn't work. And so um, the, the way around this is by disabling files. So we create all those files, um, but most of them or many of those modern ones are disabled by default or deactivated. Um, and if you want to use them, you, you need to enable them first. Um, then in this way, we make sure that um, somebody who doesn't know about those files and doesn't want to use those files still gets a decent behavior from the UE, uh, where those who actually want to use them can enable them and then uh, have whatever new uh, fancy features enabled in those files. So one example, for example, is the EF dot um, EHPLMN. Um, this EHPLMN is the uh, equivalent home PLMN list. So um, in this file, you can basically specify what other MCC and MNC should be considered a home network. Normally, it's basically the first uh, digits of the IMZ that determine the MCC and MNC of the home uh, uh, PLMN, of the home network. But then there are sometimes operators where there are additional other MCC MNCs, which are also considered the home network, which should not be considered roaming. Um, this is particularly uh, in case of network sharing and, and MVNOs and so on. This is something that is used. 
Um, this file, we in, on an earlier Sysmocom card, we used to have it enabled and it created a lot of problems where people uh, basically shoot themselves in the foot with it. So it's disabled now and we get this um, response uh, selected file invalidated. So invalidated and uh, deactivated are synonymous terms. Um, it depends on the type of spec that you look at. Some call it uh, invalidated and some others call it deactivated. So it's, uh, I think uh, Etsy calls it invalidated and uh, 3GPP calls it um, uh, deactivated or something like that. So in order to make use of this file, we need to enable the file first. And um, if we remember our help commands, there actually were these administrative commands. Um, uh, where is it? It's not, ah, we don't see that command right now because we are still in the context of the elementary file PLM, FPLMN. And of course, from this context at the current location of the file system, we cannot activate or deactivate any file because, well, the file that we're using right now must be activated because we are already using it um, and we cannot work with any other file. So um, uh, I'm going back into the directory in the ADF USIM. And if I type now help, then actually I will see, um, yeah, here, that we have deactivate file and activate file as commands available. And, um, so again, what I wanted to select this and it says, well, um, uh, it's, it's invalidated, but what I can do is I can do activate file. Um, there's no um, uh, error message. So now I should be able to select it. And yes, now the file is active and I can select it and I can uh, see what is written in it. And uh, indeed there is already a record in it um, for 90170. Um, so uh, the, the card, or the, the phone complying with the 3GPP specification um, would now uh, consider the 90170 as its home network. The problem is as soon as you have the EFH, EHPLMN on the card, uh, it will no longer automatically use the prefix from your IMSI. So remember the IMSI was a 99970 IMSI. Um, and now here we have 90170 in the equivalent HPLMN. So the configuration right now is inconsistent and it doesn't make sense. So the phone would no longer register in the 99970 network. It would only register, the only home network that it would recognize is a 90170 network. And then it would use its 99970 IMSI to register to it. And if it can register, it would consider itself to be in its home network. So if you want to have additional um, uh, PLMNs, then actually you need to add a record for 99970 here. So then, the IMSI prefix 99970, which is no longer considered, has to be explicitly included in the EHPLMN file. So this, this is all how the 3GPP specs works, nothing that PySim or Sysmocom uh, have any say in that. This is just how the specs work. Um, another thing that you have to keep in mind is that, and that's again specs, it's not PySim. PySim is just a tool to, to, uh, to work with them. Um, activating the file itself is not sufficient. You also need to enable the related service in the use in service table. So there is a file called ef.ust, the use in service table. And the use in service table is basically a long bit mask. Um, let's read it in binary. So it's a bit mask and it's, it tells the modem, the user equipment, what kind of optional features um, or services uh, this uh, use in, um, implements. And it was something like, ah, who of course. Um, then uh, we get uh, we we it, we get a decode of this information. Um, so what I did here is I did read binary decode it, but since that puts out hundreds of lines and is very you have to scroll and search for it. Uh, one feature of PySim is that you can just pipe through normal shell commands. So here we used grep with uh, two lines of uh, context and we grep for equivalent since we're looking for the equivalent HPLMN. And here we see service 71 activated false and the description is equivalent HPLMN. And what we need to do if we want to actually use this file, we also need to activate the service. So what we do now is we say uh, help. And we see that there is a EFUST file specific command, you know, here, uh, sorry, you know, 
German. Um, exactly here. So um, we have USD service activate and USD service deactivate. So what we can do, let's um, read it again. So now we can do something like USD service activate 71. And now if I reread it, I get 71 activated true. So now the service 71 is activated, uh, telling the modem that uh, the EF EHPLMN exists um, and contains um, supposedly correct content. So the modem is permitted to use that file. Um, uh, it's important that uh, there is a consistent um, uh, configuration. So if you just enable the file and uh, disable the service, according to the spec, no phone should use it. But are you sure that there's no phone out there that has an implementation bug where it doesn't check the, the service table and just uses the information in the file anyway? So I personally always would advise to keep those two in a consistent state. Um, also the other way around, if you enable the service here in the uh, UST, but you deactivate the file, you might run into bugs in the in, in the baseband uh, protocol stack where then it, it fails to read the file and behaves in some weird way or even declares the SIM card as illegal or something like that. So it's uh, generally useful to keep those two in sync. Uh, we have implemented a command, um, UST service check, that checks for the consistency between um, uh, the services as indicated in the USIM service table and the actual files um, uh, that exist. So it basically goes through all the services and um, then uh, checks, well, okay, service number two is active. And if service number two is active, um, well, actually, um, I would have to check the spec now, which is what here. Um, I think the error messages actually belong to the service that's listed below. Otherwise, it no, it doesn't make sense. I'd have to check, um, uh, but in any case, uh, basically it runs through the services and tells you dis discrepancies. Um, yeah, here, for example, we say service 36 inactive. Um, so the service uh, says it's inactive, but the file related to the service is actually selectable. So to make it consistent, you could deactivate the file uh, EFDCK um, and uh, turn it into a, a consistent configuration. So why is the card an inconsistent configuration when it ships? Uh, for historical reasons. Um, so uh, only for new files, we, we have this policy uh, that we deactivate the file and deactivate the service. In a previous Sysmocom card products, we always had the files present, selectable, but the service is disabled here. And that is basically what you see here with this is selectable and, uh, and so on. Um, here we have another inconsistency, but um, actually I have the feeling that there's something also broken in this consistency check. I have to investigate. Um, so th these are uh, expected, but uh, this one actually is weird, and I will look. I will look into that uh, later on. But yeah, this is a, a tool that uh, can detect such inconsistencies if you are interested in that. Okay. Um, I will deactivate the service again, just so my card is in a consistent state and I will deactivate file ef.ehplm and here, so. Ah, okay. Actually the way how it works is I first select the ef.ehplm, see I don't do this every day and then I can do deactivate file and now it's deactivated. Um, okay, so that was a, a example about this, um, bringing in the use and service table um, uh, and so on and, and, and these uh, bits and pieces. Another common task that we see uh, recently is that people want to pay, play with the modern 5G security uh, features such as the concealed subscriber identifier, the SUCI. Um, and uh, this is something that uh, the, the data for it gets uh, stored in a file um, First, there is a 5G system directory underneath the USIM application. That's where we are now. There's a lot of files uh, up to release 17, and there's the Suchi calc info file. Um, which is empty 
in this case. Um, uh, and this uh, file contains the uh, key material uh, for the computation of the concealed subscriber identifier by the um, UE. So there's two different ways how this works. Uh, one is that uh, the key material is uh, stored in the SIM card and never leaves the SIM card and the cryptographic op operations, I think it's elliptic curves, uh, uh, cryptography, are performed inside the SIM card. And the second option is uh, to have the computation inside the phone and just the key material on the card. So the phone will read the key material from the card and then perform this uh, calculation. Um, what we're looking at here is the, the second option um, uh, and uh, no key material is configured, obviously, since uh, well, uh, it's not, not really something that we can, as card uh, manufacturer, can um, uh, give any reasonable default. It's the keys that you, uh, an, as a network operator, have in your network. So uh, that would have to be stored here. Uh, again, how does the format look like? Uh, you would have to look at the source code or look at some documentation uh, to figure that out. Um, I have a prepared file here um, that contains some content that I, is from, a, I think, a Vodafone SIM, actually a production network here. Um, so I'm first deleting all of this. Um, and this is basically how uh, the data looks like. So we have here the public keys of two um, key identifiers. Um, and here the priorities uh, for those. And if I write this on the card, you can see now it's uh, stored on the card um, in uh, this uh, format, um, of course. Ah, yeah, and a second, of course, again, we have the question of which, um, which uh, files uh, or which services do we need to in, uh, activate in the using service table? The same applies here. So we now have valid data in the file but this is not used unless the uh, EFUST service is um, uh, has a matching configuration. So we can do ADF USM slash EFUST, um, read binary decoded, grep C2, um, CT. Uh, I'm surprised I'm uh, not getting the, ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I know that it's service num number 124 that we need to enable, um, but it was not printed here because, well, actually, uh, the acronym is expanded here. So grabbing uh, for Suchi only gives you the service 125, which is the calculation by the USIM, which is explicitly not what we wanted to configure here. So, um, yeah, but um, we would need to activate the service, um, USD service activate 124. Um, and now we have that service activate. In case you have any doubt about such things, uh, what you need to do or uh, what you can do, uh, just look at the spec. In this case, uh, I already mentioned it, it's the 31.102. Um, uh, so um, if you look in the spec and actually in, in events, uh, you can put, um, or you used to be able to put uh, chapter numbers here or some, but um, I can, also, um, look at this. Uh, so EF Suchi Calc Info uh, is here described in the spec, and it tells you if Suchi calculations were performed by the USM. Um, uh, no, sorry, this is the sentence I'm looking for. Uh, so service number 124 is the one that relates to this file, or actually the first one. If Suchi calculations performed by the ME. Uh, service number 124 is available and service number 125 is not available, this file shall be present. Um, and uh, this is basically, if you want to use this file, you need to have 124 enabled and 125 disabled. Um, and no, that is the wrong window. That was the right one. And this is exactly what we have here. Um, actually, let's do the full decode once. Let's scroll it through. So here we see 124 is activated and 125 is deactivated. So this is the the, the necessary UST uh, configuration for uh, what we did, just did, uh, storing the key material in this file. I'm again uh, reversing that. Um, Just 
moving all this stuff here. My card is again in a consistent state. And yes, I'm missing a comma here. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, another common thing that people want to configure. Another um, common thing to change, for example, is the key material or the uh, the the, uh, the cryptographic algorithm. Um, now, this is where we get into things that are not 3GPP standardized. I mean, the algorithm, of course, but basically how the key material is stored in the card and which algorithm the card supports is entirely an implementation detail. But uh, since PySIM has support for the Syscom uh, cards, what we can do is we can do select um, ADF USIM, for example, um, and we can select EF dot um, USIM auth keys. This is the file that uh, where the key material is stored in in this specific uh, card, and we can do read binary decoded, and we see some configuration um, as well as the K and OP or OPC value. So here it says OPC instead of OP. So this value is actually the OPC and not the OP value. And that is the key. And we have millenage enabled right now. And let's say we want to switch to uh, another algorithm. Excuse me for a second. So, um, uh, we can switch the algorithm by uh, changing the contents of this file. Um, uh, let me just uh, quickly uh, check. Uh, I guess it's so. Let's switch to XOR, for example. Let's just change the algorithm here to XOR. Test algorithm. And when I read it back now, it switched to XOR. So now the completely insecure for uh, development and lab use only uh, XOR algorithm with a, a cryptographic uh, security level of minus uh, 10,000 is enabled um, instead of the millenage, uh, which is actually a production algorithm uh, that we can use. Um, the New SJA5 cards not only support uh, XOR for 2G and 3G and Millenage for 2G, 3G and COMP128 version 1, 2, 3 for 2G, um, but also the new TUAC uh, authentication algorithm, uh, which has much more configuration and much more uh, parameters to, um, uh, to uh, specify. Um, I have, again, a prepared file for a TUAC configuration, so here we can specify the key length and uh, the size of, of the encryption and integrity protection key and uh, the size of the Mac and the results and so on. So many different things can be configured and also the uh, OP and uh, K values are much longer. So um, this is now a change to uh, to how you would set this for to work. And once again, if you worried about the uh, how, how to find out what kind of va values are available in the JSON document. You can look at the source code. In this case, I think we don't actually have a regression test, which is um, a pity. Um, that needs to be changed. But uh, we have a declarative um, um, parser here. Um, and you can actually see for TUAC, uh, we have CFG, uh, TUAC, CFG, number of Keshak iterations, OPC and K. And then the CFG goes to CFG by TUAC, which is specified here. And uh, then you even see, well, the values that are permitted, um, like which key lengths and so on. Uh, so this can give you an idea about uh, the values that you can use um in in uh in in building such a json um document uh, that um complies with the uh what this uh system supports so um yeah that uh was uh, this um Example, uh, I'm just going to leave it here. I can reset that later. Um, oh, actually, I can also reset it now. I think we still have it here. Yeah, the original config um, to get back to my 
original SIM card. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's um, uh, back to where we were originally. Oh, typing is sometimes difficult, especially when talking at the same time. So, um, yeah, another demo or example that I can give you is, uh, for example, to enable mission critical services. Um, 5G has uh, optional features for mission critical push to talk, mission critical uh, data, and all kinds of other services. And um, whether or not a UE is um, permitted to use such services or to, to request such services from the network is stored again in another file. So we can. Uh, UAC AIC uh, is the, the file name for this. Again, you can find it in the specification. And here you can see the mission critical service is uh, disabled. And you can enable that just by switching that false into a true. Um, and uh, then uh, the UE will start to request uh, mission critical services from the, if the UE supports it, of course, from the network which means that even at the RRC layer, um, there will be different um, parameters encoded and uh, there are some network implementations which uh, do not support this. So we had uh, in, in a previous product, in the SJA2 product, we had this enabled and set to true by default. And there were many people complaining that they couldn't register with the Sysmocom card uh, to 5G standalone networks of certain vendors. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, the users did not bother to uh, properly configure uh, the contents of all those cards. So now we switch to the more conservative default of having those disabled. And whoever wants uh, to use mission critical services in the 5G network um, can then enable this uh, flag on the file. But there again, you see how sort of it bites you uh, if you try to enable all the features um, and then the UE behaves as specified and then the network side maybe doesn't support that feature and it, it, it uh, trips over. So it's uh, very important that all of those uh, files and configurations are all configured exactly uh, like it's required for the given network. Um, yeah. Okay, um, that's sort of what I wanted to show uh, here in the demo. Um, I'm very happy to demo other things in case somebody has any questions or has any idea what uh, should be demoed. So now I hand it over to you. Um, let me know what you want to know or what you want me to try or show. The question was, is there a mapping between MCC, MNC tuples and canonical network names on the card or is that just in the UE? Um, it can be either or it can be both. So traditionally um, in old GSM phones, there was only a hard-coded uh, com hard compiled in table in the phone. Um, later on, that is a table that could be modified um, in a sense that uh, whenever there was such a successful network registration and the MM info message with the network name was received, the phone would update its internal table on the phone. Um, and then uh, later on, there were some additions to the SIM card specifications, how um, operators could put uh, network names on the SIM card. Um, this uh, um, and, and this all then gets uh, merged together. So there is a table now i'm trying to remember which file it was in of my head um spn hmm. ah typos yeah spn yeah um so here, I think we can actually just provide a single service provider name. I think there was uh, something else. Um, let me just quickly check the spec. Um, maybe it was just on the USIM. Service provider name. 
So let's try to name icon. Yeah, you can even put an icon on the card. Um, yes, I saw that before. Yes, P and I. Yeah, and then you can have a list of PLMNs in a TLV that tells you when the service provider name shall be displayed. Um, but I think there is um, there is uh, something else than this service provider name. Okay, yeah, so it's just one name uh, that you can store in this, but there might be something else. I think there's even a file, I forgot about it now, right now, but where you can specify different operator names to be displayed in different location areas or tracking areas, something like this. Ah, yeah, Michaela already posted, uh, there's the PNN, the provider network name, and the OPL, the operator list, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the reminder. I uh, knew there was something, but I didn't recall the, the details, so. Um, OPL. Yeah, so the operator list is, is the one where you specify the MCC, MNC, and the location area code range or mask. Um, and then you tell it, well, use this PNN record. Uh, so the, a given record number in the EF.PNN, which contains the actual names. So it's like pointers. Um, and here we don't have any names in, in the PNN file, but this is where, where you would store this. Yeah. Um, there was another question or comment. I'm wondering if we can somehow auto generate documentation for EFs from the respective construct definitions. That this field names hierarchy would be very helpful. Yes, um, of course, it would be useful. As I said, it's a known problem. Um, I think. Um, my strategy would so for some files yes it's possible but for some others i think it will be very difficult to um to generate that i mean ideally you would have a json schema generated actually that uh like in a machine readable format defines what kind of parameters are permitted where and, and so on um, but i guess that will be probably difficult at least in some situations um my idea is more that we make sure that we have um unit tests meaningful unit tests in in the code and then include them automatically in the documentation as examples for the given files so that you have like one, three, four different uh, real world examples um, in the documentation, um, uh, how that should look like. And I think that will already be um, helpful to users. And um, uh, given that those examples are actually executed by the unit tests, we also know that these examples will work um, and they're not some stuff that's out of date or somehow generated and might not be uh, exactly working. That's the question, what's the diff actually? Um, so fundamentally, um, the first difference is that it's a different, well, it's different chips because the old chip that was used in the SJA2 was no longer uh, end of life and no longer available. Um, and the second difference is that it's a completely different uh, operating system, a much, uh, much, probably, I don't know, eight years or something, or at least five years of difference in operating system development there. So it's a much more recent uh, smart card operating system on it. And then uh, the differences from there are mostly in the profile or in the capabilities exposed by the operating system. So um, the SJA2 doesn't support the TUAC algorithm. It doesn't support SOAR for testing. Um, those are constraints by the operating system and um, uh, you can't really do that uh, with the, this old operating system. And then uh, the, 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 the same more user visible profile differences. Actually, there's a section in the user manual. If you look at the this is more ISM SJA5 user manual. There's a section called change log somewhere. Well, I can just look for it. It's definitely in there, even though it's not, yeah. I didn't see it in the index. Ah. So why it keeps jumping around. Uh, okay, yeah. So here you see the major new feature list um, compared. So yeah, even TLS 1.2 for OTA and uh, 
AES uh, previous card only was, I think, um, this, or if AES, then only 128 bit capable, and so on. And then you also have a change log for uh, the version uh, zero, version one, and um, uh, yeah. So you can look at all the low level details in, in, in this uh, user menu. Um, Keith uh, says, at one point, I think you mentioned having example key data from another card. How are sensitive data on the card protected to prevent cloning, etc.? Well, the keys that I showed or that I copied from another card are just the keys for generating uh, the subscriber concealed identifier. And uh, as I said, there are two different uh, ways to do this. One is uh, the computation in the UE and the other one is the computation on the card. Of course, on the card is more secure um, because th those keys never leak. On the other hand, that requires the card needs to do elliptic curve crypto, which means you need a, um, a cryptographic uh, hardware accelerator for that specific purpose, meaning you need a more expensive and more recent chip, um, meaning you need to pay more for your card. Um, so that's, an, that's a choice that the operator makes whether or not this specific key is uh, accessible to anyone who has authenticated themselves with the user pin against the card, um, or whether they want to do this entirely on the card itself. Uh, the normal keys for authentication and so on, those are all um, stored in the card and uh, not accessible unless you authenticate yourself with uh, the ADM1 pin. Um, so that's not something you, you get access to um, on, on the card, on any card. And uh, in general, um, you can expect that there's a lot of attention uh, at this since, uh, as you mentioned, uh, being able to copy the keys would mean you could clone the card, which would mean you break the, um, the business of uh, mobile operators. So uh, they have a very strong um, incentive not, not to make you capable of uh, reading that key material in a reasonable effort. But in the end, there's no, let's say, no mandatory uh, standard or specification. It's in the end, it's up to the operator, right? If you if you are the operator of a certain network, it's up to you uh, to decide what kind of uh, SIM card with what kind of operating system with what kind of security features uh, you purchase or not. Uh, next question is, could you, in theory, write a custom card operating system for the SJA5? I remember the CC32RS512 had a dip variant with exposed JTAG and whatnot. Um, so um, this is not, well, okay. Sysmocom could, in theory, do it, but uh, the downstream customers uh, could not, um, meaning that of course, we can buy those cards or anyone can buy those chips um, in quantity, uh, in card form factor, uh, in a way where they only have the bootloader and no operating system installed. Um, but the way how we sell those cards, they have the operating system installed and uh, they are already personalized. So the lifecycle state is at a point where you cannot um, go back to the bootloader and install uh, a random other a card operating system. Um, the main reason why it's not, well, why it's uh, in practice not possible is again, the lack of documentation. So um, the chips that we use from Samsung and Infineon, um, even we don't have any uh, documentation on, on the hardware. Um, it's sort of known that uh, they use a ARM uh, secure core. Uh, that's an ARM core family. Uh, derived from Cortex M0 plus or M3, depending on what you do, and SC000, SC300. Um, but then ARM doesn't document anything about those core either, um, mm -hmm. other than that they are derived from the Cortex M0 or Cortex M3. Um, but then they have all kinds of additions um, that you don't know. And then the, the integrator, uh, Samsung or Infineon or whoever it is, um, they probably then put uh, whatever kind of NAND flash peripheral and uh, 
ISO 7816, UART, and whatever other peripherals around that core, um, and add uh, flash and RAM of their choosing. And at this point, you basically you don't know anything anymore about uh, how to program it, even though uh, it would execute normal uh, instructions of a Cortex M0 or Cortex M3 microcontroller. So that's sort of the um, the constraint there. Um, and depending on the chip you source, um, also. Um, so as I said, for you, you can buy the the chips in in the bootloader stage where they don't have an operating system installed. Um, uh, for some cards or some vendors, um, it's possible to, but you can actually just install an operating system without any cryptography in that state. But for the more higher end chips, even that is basically already dongled down, and you need to like you have basically a secure boot chain. So your uh, your operating system needs uh, some kind of signature or some kind of key material to actually uh, use the bootloader to install that. Um, uh, I haven't looked at this in detail. It's not uh, what we do, but uh, it's on the more sophisticated chips that is this definitely the case. Um, 